Hello. Can you state your name for me, please? Bernard Kiwi. What community in Germany are you from? What is the name of the community that you're from? Königsberg, East Prussia. That's the capital of that part of East Germany. And today it is known as Kaliningrad because it is a harbor owned by the Russians. Well, it started on in November uh, Kristallnacht when four Nazis came to the house at four o'clock in the morning and uh, after searching for papers and stuff like that they took my father away but before they took him away they decided to, they would like to get the keys for the factory which my father had the keys for the factory. This was a clothing factory owned by Jews and they uh, exported clothes, suits, coats and so on to different outlets in Germany and outside of Germany. My father's job was to pack the stuff up for shipment and uh, but we didn't give them the keys and so therefore they departed after not fulfilling their obligation, except that they took my father away, plus other residents in the apartment buildings to an unknown destination. My mother, after normalizing the situation, decided to find out where my father was, and we found out that due to the fact that Poland was still an independent country, no concentration camps were located outside of Germany, so they held him in the local prison until such time as we found out. So how old were you when all this was? Ten uh, years old. You were ten years old. Well, we left Germany once we secured passage because it was the only country available without any visas. So you didn't, all you needed was passage. So we secured the passage, but before we secured the passage, my mother went to the Jewish community and asked them for help, and they decided that Shanghai was not a good place for Jews to immigrate. Criminals went to Shanghai, but normal people didn't go to Shanghai. But my mother decided, in order to save our life, I would like to be a criminal rather than a free man. So we secured the passage. We went to first to Berlin to say goodbye to my grandfather and to my step-grandmother. And we proceeded with the train to, to the Brenner Pass, which was the last German station that they could uh, secure uh, by looking at your paper, see that everything is normal and we finally ended up in Trieste, Italy. Now Italy was part of German uh, configuration, but Italy was not yet to the stage that Germany was with the Jewish problem. Why did your mom choose Shanghai? Well, it was a miracle, because we tried every other place, no visa, no passage, no affidavits, so the only place that we could secure passage without any difficulty was Shanghai. So it was uh, almost a miracle that we picked Shanghai. Well, when we came to Shanghai, it was a we ended up in the lowest uh, community in Shanghai. Shanghai is a beautiful city. It has a French concession, has a British concession, which was independently uh, governed by Britain and France. But Hongqiu was the miracle, the poorest section of Shanghai. Trucks were waiting for us, took us to a camp that they were secured for us to live. We got there, hundreds of people together. Uh, we slept in one bed, four people in one bed, with a curtain separating us from the next passengers. One bathroom for the whole compound, so it was a miserable situation, until 
the community was organized, it was haphazard standards of living. Where where did you live once you got there? Like once you all arrived in Shanghai? We were in the camp. My sister and my brother and my two brothers. No, no school no yet. No school? No school yet. Not a school since the synagogue in Germany burned until Shanghai. No school until a rich Iraqi Jews created the school and they started uh, normalizing the situation where kids went to school in order to get an, a part education. So you didn't get an education at all once you, when you got to Not Shanghai? Not when I got to Shanghai. What about your brothers? Them too or no? No, they all, all, all of us, us were in okay. the same situation. Uh, we didn't speak any language, not Chinese. We spoke German, and if you knew Yiddish, you could speak Yiddish, but basically the communication was uh, not existent. We didn't know what was happening. I mean, nobody told you anything, and there was little uh, communication between the people. Everybody uh, fought for themselves, existed for themselves. Those that had some money, uh, secured housing to the Chinese, from Chinese uh, uh, residents. Those that had no money had to be dependent on the uh, edifices that the joint distribution co uh, provided for us. Uh, not till about 13 years, we started going to a Talmud Torah where they taught us Hebrew and we also started to go to the first classes of school and we got some uh, experience in languages, not much, but at least the beginning of some communication for language. The school was a beautiful edifice that Mr. Kaduri secured for us with classes from kindergarten up and teachers. Now remember, there were teachers that came from Germany and Austria and Hungary and so on who had already some knowledge of education, so they substituted, they became teachers in, 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 in lieu of anything else. When you went to these schools, were there, the people that were enrolled were basically people that were in some, somewhat of a similar situation? Absolutely. No outsiders were. All teachers were local teachers who came the same direction that we came, who escaped Europe, to come to Shanghai. Do you think that it was hard for your mom to be there without your father? Well, it was hard for her, but remember, she secured a job in working in the kitchen that the joint provided for us, where she peeled potatoes and cooked and so on. So at least we had some income, not much, but enough to provide us for some food and uh, until my father came. Not that my father was a great help, because he, he was not schooled for anything other than when he was in Germany, there was no factories there to provide for employment. What was synagogue like? Well, it was a temporary synagogue, but it was enough for prayers, for morning, for evening, at least you had some semblance of religion. And when, when the yeshiva, when the upper echelon came, we are Vladivostok and we are Japan to China. They expanded the, their own education and also parceled some education to refugees who want to participate in it. I had my bar mitzvah there. It was not a great bar mitzvah. I didn't have a lot of food, but we had a little cookies and and to, by by the way, the teacher who taught me my bar mitzvah was killed by B-29s who bombed Shanghai and hit the refugee camp. And he was one of the first people who got killed in the, in the bombardment. It was the Shanghai Jewish Synagogue. And how old were you when you left Shanghai to go? 18. And you went straight to Atlantic City from there? No. No? I went to San Francisco. Okay. And uh, I went on a troop transport, which was converted to a passenger liner. We came to San Francisco, and in San Francisco I spent a couple of days there uh, to not because the, uh, until the trains left and so on, until I got passage to the 
by train to, to Atlantic City. So then I left uh, San Francisco, ended up on to Chicago. In Chicago I trained chain, trains and got to Philadelphia. In Philadelphia I changed trains to Atlantic City. My, my mother, and fa my mother, my father, my brother, and my sister went to Israel. They were evacuated from Shanghai once the communist Chinese took over Shanghai. I came by myself and I stayed with an I had three aunts in, in Atlantic City. One of them was a survivor of a concentration camp with a husband, no children. One was married and came before Kristallnacht to Atlantic City. One was in London. So your passage to get on the ship to go to Shanghai, that, did that, that cost money, did Oh, yeah. yeah. How much money would you say? About $600 per person, a little bit less for kids, because one of the kids was only four months old. One was uh, eight years old, one was 10 years old, and I was uh, Ten, I was ten years. My brother was eight years old. Different. My father made. He was a middle class. Didn't make a big money, but at least had employment. Once at Atlantic City, uh, I did. I got employment. I worked in a Venetian blind factory. I also worked in a restaurant, a very fine restaurant, and I worked in another restaurant. Then I worked in a hotel as a waiter. And uh, finally, I decided that uh, Atlantic City was not my place. And I went to Trenton, New Jersey, and worked in a linoleum factory. Very dangerous job because you said you had to be upstairs, see the linoleum, and if you fell down, you got killed. So I, I decided that the linoleum factory was not my capacity. I, I, and I was drafted by the Army. I decided to go to the Air Force and I enlisted in the Air Force.